Well, another episode of Jay Leno's Garage. Something kind of special this week. You know, we love aero engine vehicles here. You've seen the Hispano Suiza, the 27 liter Merlin we're working on. Uh, this is one of my favorites, 1917 Fiat. 21.7 uh, liters, almost 22 liters, big six cylinder Fiat aero engine. Now this car came from Argentina, built in Argentina, went to Italy. Back in the early days was a guy named Eldridge. He built a car called the uh, Metastopheles, I believe it was called. Uh, it's, if you look it up on the web, Google it, you'll see it was a, the, one of the first aero engine monsters. That had a, the same engine as this, the almost 22 liter Fiat. And at one point it was the fastest car in the world, 146 miles an hour. And it was the last car ever to set a land speed record on a public road. And that car is currently in the Fiat Museum. There was a, well, there was a gentleman back in the day who really liked that car and wanted to build his version of it. And he tracked down one of the engines and he built this car. Uh, he later got in an accident. Uh, the car was wrecked. It was thought lost for many years. Then it was discovered by our friends at Persang. Now you've heard us talk about Persang in Argentina. They're the ones that did that just fantastic Alfa Romeo. Uh, well, here, take a look. Here it is there. And they've done uh, a number of Bugattis, and they just built beautiful, beautiful replicas in the truest sense of the word replica, in the sense that they copy the original car almost down to a T. You know, replica has gotten a bad uh, name lately because people put a Volkswagen engine in the back of some kind of kit car, and they put a Bugatti radiator on it, and they call it a replica. Well, that's not a replica. By replica, I mean an exact copy of the original, using the original sort of factory drawings and manufacturing processes and things of that nature. Anyway, Persang found the engine, rescued this car, rebuilt it back in the 90s, and I got them from there. Let's meet John Bothwell. John, how you doing? Great. Good, Good to see, see you. So tell folks a little bit of the history of this car. Uh, well, this is a little bit different than our typical work. Uh, as you said, we do a lot of the recreations, exact copies of right. cars. This is in a separate category because this was really reviving a car that somebody else had created. Right. Uh, Adolfo Scandrolio in Argentina uh, was, was mesmerized by Lord Eldridge right. and the Mephistopheles in England. And so when he was able to buy an original Fiat A12 BIS engine, uh, he built his own version of that in Argentina. And that's going back to the 20s. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the, the engine in this car arrived uh, in the port in Buenos Aires and El in, uh, Scandrolio picked it up with a horse-drawn cart. Right, so yeah. uh, it, it, was, it was a little bit different, but, yeah. you know, variation of the same theme. And when he built the car back in the day, there was no transmission, no brakes, right? That, that's right. It was, <laughs> it was a low-budget project. Yeah, I get a little budget of that. <laughs> and I'm going to show you a picture of the car. The car originally had a big hook hanging right up here, a giant hook. And the idea of that was when the car went off the road, which it often did because it had no <laughs> brakes, the hook would, would grab the barbed wire because Argentina with the ranching, right. so many of the roads had barbed wire that rather than get decapitated, the big hook would, in theory, grab, in theory, in in theory, theory. Yeah. grab up the barbed wire before it decapitated you. Right. Uh, needless to say, the guy died in the car, didn't right, he? Right, right, yeah. 1949. Yeah. And he died in the car in 49, and he cracked the block, and we'll show you where it was patched back in the day in just a second. But what other history? The engine, of course, came out of one of the famous uh, Fiat World War I planes. Right, right. Uh, th there were several planes that this engine was used in. It's just it's an enormous engine. Yeah. It's mind-boggling to think that anything could have gone off the ground with this in it. But yeah, yeah. You know, it served a purpose well in the race cars later. Here's a picture of one of the planes it was in. But I think we've kept people in suspense long enough. Let's show them this motor. Yeah. Unlike today, when you open the hood of a car, you just kind of go, eh, OK, there's a battery and a big piece of plastic. But back in the day, you'd open the hood and people go, ooh, ah. And that was probably the epitome of that was the V16 Cadillac. Mm -hmm. You know, when, uh, when Cadillac started a styling department, they were the first to do under the hood styling. So when you, when you opened the hood, you'd see copper and chrome and brass and all the wires would be encased in these beautiful, uh, beautiful chrome runners and things. Uh, this engine's kind of like that. Let's show you what we have here. Pretty advanced for the period. Don't forget, this is 
1912 to 1917. It is 22 liters or 21.7, four valves per cylinder, overhead cam. You've got a bevel drive to the overhead cam. You have twin mags. Here's the accident we talked about that killed, uh, <laughs> killed the last owner. Uh, the guys, it was patched back in the day, correct? That's right. As you can see, and a pretty good patch. It's still holding. 60 years on, the patch is still holding. Uh, just giant toilet bowl carburetors. This, this thing eats gas like nothing I've ever seen. Uh, figure each cylinder is the equivalent of a 350 Chevy. Right. Each piston is a 350 Chevy, okay? They put that in your mind, okay? Now you have six of them. It's just <laughs> but it's not as loud, actually, as the Hisso, but that's probably because of the four valves. But pretty sophisticated for the day, as I said, overhead cam and bevel drive. Um, what you have to do is lubricate these valves by hand before you start it as a precaution. Uh, the car has a four-speed gearbox. As you can see, it is chain drive. Most of these gearboxes were based on the pre-war, and when I say pre-war, I mean World War I, Mercedes gearbox, uh, and that's what this is. Uh, it was not built by Fiat, but it was built using a Fiat engine and primarily Fiat parts. I believe that is the Mercedes transmission that, That's is, that is in there. Um, here are your dampers here. Not really shock absorbers. Your chain here. You've got mechanical brakes. Uh, the car is probably good for 146, 147 miles an hour. And you have mechanical brakes on the rear wheels only. Do the math. Yeah, not real good. But you can use your handbrake if you want. You can pull that back. Um, let me show you what we have here. Here's your fuel filler tank right here. Takes about 50 gallons. It is a dry sump system, so your oil goes right in here. Uh, this is your fuel pump. You just pump this until you pressurize the tank. If you're driving along and you feel the car start to spit a little bit, oh, reach over, give it a couple more pumps, bring it up to about a pound and a half, two pounds, and she's fine. Uh, and it actually works quite well. You know, most cars had that sort of uh, fuel delivery system, just pressurized. What most automobiles had back in the day was a pump on the engine that just kind of maintained pressure in the tank. Since this is an airplane, it was not meant for automotive application. We, we do it by hand. But this has just a nice feel to it. It's like, like winding the, uh, the gears of a nice uh, you know, pocket watch. It just sort of clicks in and it eh, just, just has the right sort of feel. There's your tachometer, oil pressure right there, water temperature, horn, and uh, lights right there. There's your twin mags. This one here is your advance and retard for ignition, and that is a uh, hand throttle. Um, it's fun, to it's fun to drive. This thing just goes dun, 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 down the road. Uh, unique styling. Um, this looks like some sort of jet exhaust on here. A lot of copper in the car. As I said, twin chain drive. Uh, big single headlight up front. As you can see, the car has a nice patina to it. There's your exhaust. As you see, it's a twin plug head. Uh, this is our radiator overflow here. Put a set of modern horns on it just so, since you can't stop, it'd be nice to just let people know they should get out of the way. So you blow those horns. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it. As you see, massively overbuilt. Tremendous frame. Just for safety's sake, we've replaced the cables here and we put new drive chains on. You don't want to hang your hand down like this when you're driving. You don't want to get stuck in that chain. That'll, that'll pretty much do you in. But Well, that's the car. I think it's time to go for a ride. And there's a bit of a pre-flight ritual you have to do. Let's uh, do that right now. We'll open the hood. First thing you want to do is uh, pre-oil in and around the valve train. George is coming in with our handy uh, pre oil that we you can use 50 weight oil. What do we have here, assembly lube? It's assembly lube and, and oil. And oil. Yeah. And we put a little bit in and around here, up here as well. You know, you're dealing with iron that's 100 years old. But if you keep everything lubricated, 
Hopefully it'll run for another hundred. And the fun part is seeing this engine start up. Oh, you gotta do that. Just when you think you're done, you gotta do the other side as well. Hit this side. But the machine is remarkably uh, smoke free. It, it runs pretty clean. You probably don't need to do this every time you take it out, but it's just a good precaution. Okay, you wanna climb inside. Let's see what we have to do. Okay, let's retard our ignition. This is our, let's open our, let's open our oil. We have a dry sump system, so we want to do that. Now I want to do is make sure my oil cap is tight, my water gas cap is tight now. This is my fuel pump. As you can see, I'm pumping up fuel pressure. About one and a half pounds, two pounds is good. Let's go over the gauges. That's your mag, left, right mag, and both. Tachometer, water temperature, lights, and horn. There you go right there. Now what I want to do is tickle the carburetor. They sound plenty wet. Magnificent beast. There's nothing like these aero engine cars. There's no modern equivalent. Not even something like a Hemi. This is 22 liters. Each cylinder is big, as big as a 327 Chevy. Well, all the valves are going up and down. Let's take it for a ride. Driving this at 146 miles an hour with two wheel brakes on not particularly smooth roads. You know, it's such a beast, but this engine was developed in 1912 and it's, it's overhead cam, it's four valves per cylinder. the best car for LA traffic. and see what she does. As you can 
see when you sit in traffic, the plugs load up a bit. So you gotta get out of the open road and kind of put your foot in it. You don't wanna put your hands down by your side while you're driving and get them stuck in those chains. this jacket on now boiling hot that's okay it's worth it you know a lot of folks especially those under 40 have never driven a vehicle with this much torque I mean modern cars make a lot of horsepower but they don't make this stump pulling torque where you've got you know at 800 rpm it's just you can just feel like you'd pull a building down like this little trip down uh, memory lane. As I've said many times on this program, there aren't many unique driving experiences, and this is certainly one of them. Uh, yeah, let me turn off the oil. Yeah. Turn off the fuel. Let me release the pressure. There's no graceful way to get out of this thing. You just sort of stand on the seat and jump out. Let's release the pressure in the tank. You don't want to be smoking when you're doing this. And that is uh, pretty much it. It was freezing outside when we left. And after riding this thing, I'm boiling hot, even with this heavy coat on. But that's OK, because it's a piece of history. And uh, we'll see you next week.